be here now. Just be here now. Welcome, everybody, to Mind Rolling. I'm Raghu, and we have a special, special edition today that I'm really, really happy to introduce. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about BetterHelp. We have been talking about them recently in recent podcasts over the last few weeks. BetterHelp is H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com, and they are, uh, they are an online therapeutic platform. And uh, they are um, providing a service which is so needed these days and it's been so difficult, as I've said before, for people to be able to find somebody to talk to and express some of the, uh, express the stress that we've been under this last year and a half, so many so many issues, and uh, I know it's difficult because I know people. I tried actually to get with somebody, a friend of mine, to hook up with another friend, and he said, "I I can't help you. I mean, there's just no time. I'm booked up for months." So uh, BetterHelp.com provides uh, amazing professional licensed therapies and therapists, rather, and you can um, they match it up, and if based on what it is that. You tell them you need, and if it doesn't work out, they'll get you another one. And this is within 48 hours. And uh, by the way, you get 10% off uh, for the, in the first month if you just go to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P dot com slash mindrolling, and uh, give it a shot. A lot of people have, like a million people or some crazy thing. Boy, it's a lot of therapy, and uh, no wonder... Look where we are in this world of ours these days. So uh, th- now, and it's great. Of course, they are providing us with the sustenance that the network needs as we've grown so much over the last years, last couple of years especially. And, um, and they're providing a service that I personally think is extraordinarily important uh, to provide to people given the circumstances that I just explained. So betterhelp.com, give it a shot. Okay, the big surprise is this podcast is going to be without me. Now, I have done a couple in the early days, and uh, I just want to give you a little bit of the uh, circumstances as to how this got created, aside from me getting a week off. Uh, and that's, uh, well, some of you, many of you, I hope, have known about our Soul Land music series that we've had up uh, live streaming last fall, this early this spring. We're going to be doing it again. We just released this beautiful compilation, uh, Soul Land compilation, on our new Soul Land records imprint. So we put, because I used to be in the music business and with Triloka Records. And so it wasn't that difficult, and I've got wonderful help from Mungala Bray Miller. I mean, it's just fantastic what she does. And uh, so we have a situation which uh, is very pleasing, and we've got uh, so many great people. By the way, go to ramdas.org slash music, and you will catch all of the news around what Soul Land Records is, this compilation, which is, includes Krishna Das and Trevor Hall and Govindas and Radha and Papa Dosio and um, uh, so many great, great uh, acts that are all uh, connected to Soul Land. Ram Dass is Soul Land. They're connected to Ram Dass. Some of them, like Justin Beretta, have done wonderful uh, soundscapes underneath meditations and like East Forest did uh, that beautiful, beautiful record with Ram, Ram Dass. And um, then what happened, and uh, I've told this story uh, in the podcast that I did earlier this year with a man named John Forte, formerly with the Fugees. And uh, John, we got hooked up and he 
was in process to make new music and it just blew me away and I said, what can we do to help you? And, uh, and so it ends up we are helping with the marketing and the distribution of this music and uh, being involved with it is just a, a, an honor as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll agree with me, the, the potency and power of what he's done. Um, and he, we only know of him because he got turned on to Ram Dass himself years ago, be here now. And um, so he has a, an extraordinary combination of on the ground um, dealing with social injustice and dealing with the way in which he himself, of course, was brought up and, um, and uh, at the same time having a spacious, spaciousness around unconditional love is the best way. I mean, he wouldn't even put it that way. He wouldn't, I don't think. But I think, but he knows exactly what it means because that uh, part of him informs everything that he does. And, uh, and he has his art and his poetry is extraordinary. His production, music production is extraordinary. Go to ramdas.org slash music. You'll get the whole story and you'll be able to see the video that just came out, which is the first song, Ready on the One. I can't wait, really. That's my favorite thing is to turn people on to music and spirituality. So... What happened was David Silver, my original partner in Mind Rolling, and I still do things with David, we still do podcasts together, he's done incredible uh, interviews and chats with the likes of Bob Marley and Mick Jagger and on and on. Oh, I mean, just uh, I couldn't even begin to list all of the amazing people he's been with, which he's writing a book about. We're going to hear about that sometime in, I hope, the near future. Uh, but... Um, so in the end, David did this marvelous, marvelous chat and hangout with John, John Forte, and who really downloaded everything about this record, which will be out later this fall, by the way, although we're going to have another, another single song come out uh, in, a, in a month from now or so. And uh, I just want you to hear this. It's just spectacular the way David can bring out all of the essence of what this artist John uh, is offering it's really fantastic so here you go uh, this is uh, mind rolling with Mr. David Silver and Mr. John Forte on the Be Here Now Network go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and take advantage of the smorgasbord of incredible teachers and thought leaders and we'll see you next week Hi, everybody. This is Mind Rolling, and I'm David Silver. Uh, and uh, Rago asked me to do this, and I'm so thrilled to do it. We have John Forte with us. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi, David. It's Big welcome. To be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I, I'm really, I'm kind of excited about doing this because it's always interesting when you meet someone whose work you love, admire, and has inspired you. It's rare in life. And this is one of those moments, and I'm honored to do it. Um, before we started, I wanted to tell you a little story, John, um, just to set it up, sort of. It's a, a, a gigantic name-dropping story. So I'll just warn you about that. <laughs> uh, a number of years ago, I, I did a thing. Um, I, I worked with a lot of reggae artists and um, uh, did a weekly reggae show on, on New York TV. Uh, with Earl Chin, who's a, a terrific disc jockey and video man. And uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were very into our show. And we became kind of tight with them. And they asked us to do um, an interview with them. And I'll cut the story very short. It was a big drama. It ended up with Jagger calling me and Earl at one o'clock in the morning out of nowhere and saying, we're going to Jimi Hendrix's studio on 8th Street. Could, you, could we do it now? <laughs> I was sleeping, actually. And uh, so we, did, we went there. And uh, it, was, it was very <laughs> amazing. 
Uh, Bob Clearmountain was the uh, engineer, and I love Bob. I love oh, man. Bob. I love yes, man. Yeah. What a man, and what a what an artist as as well. And he was basically working with Keith, who was in an isolation booth doing the lead guitar for Emotional Rescue the song. And we did, you know, we did it, and it was great. Uh, but there were many breaks, and at one break, uh, Mick asked me, um, "I'm I'm so happy you're doing this, but if you could do something else here." what would it be? And foolishly, I said, well, you know, watching you and Keith interact and Bob and, and doing that, Mick gave me what Bob Marley called a screw face. He said, no, 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 man, no. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, artists have got magic, artists got magic. It takes creation. Deconstruction is evil. This is an exact quote. I hate to deconstruct. You're never going to see me do this. My magic is fragile. So I don't want to analyze emotional rescue much. And this is many years ago, and I, it has always stuck in my head about analyzing music with the musician that makes the music. So I'm going to try and avoid that uh, because I think it's for the people to listen to the record, which will be out fairly soon, I hope. Um, and I just want everyone to know that uh, I've listened to the record extensively, and you really have to listen to it all. And it's not a job. It's not a, it's not a, a duress. It's a pleasure and an, and an education. And uh, the record is, is called, and I, I'm very bad at these things, so I've made notes, uh, Vessels, Angels, and Ancestors. So, John, not to deconstruct, but that title is a very powerful title. Can you give us a little, a little deconstruction on the title? Vessels, angels, and ancestors. I, ever since I realized that I was in the process of recording a new album, um, when that when that moment hit me that oh this is this is something more than just a song or two. This is this is a part. This is part of a larger body of work, and I and I realized that fairly. Early on in the process, probably three three songs in, I, I, I knew that I wanted to keep going, and this began last December. Um, so, I, well, not even last December, two December's ago. So, it'd be um, December of twenty. Was it twenty? Yeah. No, no, no. It would, it would just be this past December. Yes. Um, the, the the COVID winter. And the process itself of, of recording was one that I surrendered to, one that I felt I was being guided by. Um, you know, unbeknownst to me, this album began with the murder of George Floyd and uh, a song that I wrote in the wake of that called Shame, Shame. And at the time I thought that, well, this was just an isolated event of inspiration. But I, like I said, I, I realized um, pretty, pretty quickly um, thereafter that, that I was on a, a, a bit of a larger journey. And, and that journey really was about me letting go. Um, and and being guided by the vessels or by the angels and and the ancestors allowing myself to be the the, the vessel um in this in, in in this instance but i mean even even in that title the the the, the title itself it it was you know for a while it was guidance for a while it was uh but 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 but, they, but, it, but but then it just felt like more than guidance. It felt like like I said, I was I was actively being guided, being worked with. Uh, I was in community during the creation of of this album, and I wanted very very uh, early on and very directly and very deliberately to acknowledge what was uh, at work here. When you you know. People 
talk about angels, you know, and and sometimes it fits. Sometimes it's a little obscure. From what you're saying, you feel like you were already inside something, something that was speaking to you. Um, has that been a, a, a pretty recurrent sort of process or paradigm in your creative career? Hmm. The short answer is yes. The creative process involved, uh, as long as I've been familiar with it, me being in some form of meditation, isolation, uh, some, 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 some different space. But what was remarkably different about this experience was the very, very clear surrender of my know-how, my, um, my expertise. There's always that element of doubt with the creative process, especially with, with, with me and my creative process. Am I good enough to do this? Should I be doing this? You know, it's, it, it, it's what we all, it's what we all kind of wrestle with. And do I deserve to be doing this? And, mm-hmm. and, and, and there's this, this, you know, there's this question of, of value and, and, and this internal, um, this internal battle through, 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 through every song, through sometimes every lyric to make it to the other side of that until you've reached a place where you feel comfortable enough in your art and artistry to share it with others. That mode was not as prevalent throughout the creation of Vessels, Angels, and Ancestors because that felt like that felt that, that felt moot to, to to do that at this point. It, I didn't feel any doubt about my ability to see, my or my my abilities to see this through because it was pretty clear very on that this wasn't about me and hmm. that's what that's what what felt and feels incredibly different about this body of work for me than any body of work that I've been privy to or or uh, had the privilege of um being part of you know the textures speak that not just the words not just your intention but to me the textures of the actual music because one of the things that i noticed was that the one of the reasons you captured me and i'm sure many others will follow was that there was a polarity in many of the songs of of incredible positiveness positivity and hopefulness and uh, deep spirituality. But sometimes the music, the actual instrumental music, had a, a something of a dystopian feel about it. Not strongly, subtly, but certainly at the beginning of certain songs, I'd have to go to my notes to tell you the one that I actually made the note about. Um, the one, Good Money. Mm. The opening of Good Money, I thought was amazing because... You've got things in there, surrender, death. You talk about these things. Talk about things that people are either exalted by or in tremendous fear about. And because of the, the sort of tension between the, te- the music, the instrumental music, particularly the introduction, and the words that are moving and inspiring, sort of along with that, stuck to it, 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 it just stopped any, any scintilla of pretension because of that tension. And I felt that all the way through the album. Could you, you know, am I right? Is that, is that, is that accurate? The tension, sense? the tension is, uh, is purposeful. Sometimes it's, it's in the form of, of dissonance. Um, there's a song on the album, 88, featuring Fielded, a very, very huh. talented uh, artist and, the track itself is really bass and, and this organ, and they're very sustained. Mm. It's, it's, it's sustained. You, it's, it's the same 
it's the same wheel going around and around and around. And it's a dissonant wheel. Um, but you forget somewhere in the experience that the dissonance is disruptive. Somewhere in the experience, the dissonance becomes, in my, in my, in my feeling, an appreciated uh, uh, string or, 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 or fabric of the of the overall cloth. It's something that's absolutely that that that, that wouldn't. You know that it's kind of like once you once you know that it's there, you know that it wouldn't be the same were it not for it. And the dissonance is very, very deliberate, very important to acknowledge, to include. Mm. And so I, at very... Um, again, deliberate parts throughout uh, this experience turn up uh, the dissonance. Sometimes it's turned down. There's a lot of work with space, the space in between things. Mm -hmm. This album is somewhat of a sonic continuation from an album that I released in February of 2020 called Rhythm Drive. And Rhythm Drive was a lot of guitar and bass and, and then vocals. There wasn't a lot of percussion, although there was a lot of inference. So much so in fact that a lot of, a lot of the tracks began with more elements and then ultimately I just decided to strip it away because it, 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 felt, it felt more personal, it felt more raw, it, it felt less hidden. And so, with Vessels, Angels, and Ancestors, I knew that, before I even knew that that was the title, the world that I was having the, 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 the privilege and, and the honor of um, co-creating, I, I knew that that world was not going to be a, a, an absolute wall of sound with, with all of the options. I knew that we were going to have some um, some moments that would have otherwise been you know edited out on other projects or or or, 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 or mixed over but you know a lot of that was left in a lot of that was left in here I mean there's this I have a song on here with a, a, a first take. Actually, there, there might be a couple of songs with, with, with first takes. And that, for me, 25, 30 years into my career, a first take, what? Like, because the spirit was captured and it wasn't, it wasn't important to do anything else with that, with that element. Um, and that was profound for me. To, uh, to not just surrender, but to be able to accept, to accept what, 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 what was laid before me. You know, on that song, um, I wrote something down about the woods and the, the beats. And I think it's a reference to the fact that you were in the woods listening to uh, something or even creating something, I don't know. But that is a bit of a, a sort of an epitome of the album for me because there's so many interesting polarities that we're all going through if we're in any way conscious at all right now. Some of the horrors that we know about, uh, shamefully, in this country. Um, and yet, at the same time, the, the enormous growth of conscious awareness, charity, thought for other people, uh, the destruction of the collective ego, if you like, of an entire generation. <laughs> Never completely, because we need it as a driver, but not as a motivator. 
And in, in that song, 88, um, it, 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 first of all, Fielded's the way she sings is to me was like a, a, a telecaster. Mm. I mean, her voice was like a guitar to me. I, I was astonished every time she came in. It was sort of like someone coming in with a lead, a soft lead, you know, a Mark Knopfler lead. Yeah, it was yeah. just really oh, tasteful, really, oh, really, t- oh. really delicate, and, and yet, and yet, and yet, all together powerful and impactful, and 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 hitting on every firing on, on every cylinder that it needs to without being without being over the top without being too much i mean she she, she barely doubled the vocal no oh. <sighs> spectacular yeah it's it's, it's 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 a wonderful you know an unseeable finished jigsaw puzzle that track as they all are and it's not a puzzle as much as uh, um a texture uh you know something that is constantly moving between surrender and consciousness a knowledge of what is going on on this planet in this incarnation that we're all living together in um you know you can have a really good dinner while you're watching the news sometimes foolishly and see <laughs> things you know and see things that are just so bloody awful um yes. you know and and it's hard to reconcile them because you think well maybe i shouldn't be eating or enjoying myself watching this murderous thing on television or this torture or this factor or component of oppression that's just around us at all times despite the fact that there's been a struggle about this for hundreds of years um, but the woods and the music really epitomized it for me because in the, in the whole album I just got a sense of a real necessity to understand that there's darkness and not to deny it by just saying that you're not personally dark or that you're meditating a lot, or doing hatha yoga, or traveling to nice places, or whatever. But this, again, this tension between what we observe as being the reality of the way human beings are still dealing with each other, and the larger one, or deeper one, of infinity, eternity, surrender, love, and that dynamic, uh, which leads me to my next not really a question, but you know, you've come to love of remember and, and, and Ram Das. It's not the most predictable thing in the world, in a in a way in which people are labeling things constantly. You know, we have 40,000 40, thoughts a day, and a lot of them are to do with labeling ourselves and others. Um, and what what is so obvious about this album? And about your other work too, but certainly in this one, is that it is possible and necessary to be aware of what's going on that is damn wrong and what is going on within which is damn right. And that, those two things are sometimes very difficult for people following the spiritual path to do, including myself. In other words, I'm very pissed off and angry a lot of the time about what I see. And, and yet people tell me, don't, don't be angry, you know. Don't be angry. And that's a good thing to say. But you have to be aware of why, why you're in this incarnation, why we're in this world together. We're not in it to deny it, are we? So one of the things about this album that constantly comes up, and I'd like you to talk about it, is your um, gradual but powerful immersion in a path um, which wouldn't have been predictable 25 years ago despite the fact that you were writing great music and inspiring music and so forth on your own and with the Fujis and so on. But now it's there. It is absolutely present. The fact that you are in a community, and willingly so, which is conscious, or as conscious as it can possibly be, inspired by Ramdas and other great teachers and gurus. And yet at the same time, in one of the songs, I've forgotten which one, oh yes, it's um, So Quiet Thereafter. And I thought it was going to be about something, and it wasn't. It was about something that's happening right now, which is the hideous denial of this awful thing that happened on January 6th. And that the presence of something as vile and hateful and absurd as QAnon, for instance, the storm. Let's talk about that song. I don't want to deconstruct the song, as I said, but... Let's talk about So Quiet Thereafter, because I think it embodies this 
this thing between a real awareness of, of darkness and the apprehension of light and love. Mm. Please talk about that for a, a bit, your thoughts. Yes. You've definitely sat with the, the music. I, I can <laughs> I can tell in yeah. your um your understanding of it. And I appreciate that. I hope that and I'm I'm grateful for that. I don't take that for granted. My hope is that others will take the same uh time with the music, the same patience, this the same uh same grace that that, that you have. But I'll also know that that's not a guarantee. Um, much like uh, what you what you asked me about, you know, the sort of the predictability of of my path that would lead me to here and now. There are multiple paths. There are multiple experiences happening all at the same time. Mm. When, when we talk about the existence of, of darkness and of, of, of light, you know, that's happening in the same space. And the reason why we know that is because well, you can't have one without the other. It's, it's, it's very much like breathing. And so to deny, and this is probably, you know, to the, the more enlightened folks out there who, 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 who really, really wrestle with their less enlightened uh, portions, their less enlightened bits, mm. that contrast, that contrast is what is defining and molding and shaping uh, uh, and, and, and directly contributing to this moment. And were it not for, were it not for those contrasting experiences and emotions, and, um, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be able to appreciate the other. And I don't even wanna lean too far on what's good and what's bad. Uh, for me, uh, the, the journey to, to here and now has been about feeling better, not necessarily good or bad, but feeling better. How do I feel in this moment? Is there anything that's disruptive about this moment? Checking in with that and paying attention to that. Allowing myself to learn from what doesn't feel great and not casting it aside as if it's, um, as if it's someone else or something else. Yeah. Hmm. You know, my music... <laughs> My music has definitely been impacted by my lived experience. I didn't learn how to play the guitar until you know, I was 28. And at the time I was in a federal prison and you know, learning that instrument was wholly liberating. Um, and it came at the, at the right time. It's funny because when I, when I learned it, when I, when I picked it up, you know, after my first year at 20, I thought to myself, oh, I'll probably never really be able to realistically incorporate this thing into, <laughs> into, my, into my repertoire. Mm. And, you know, here I am nearly 20 years later mm. with that instrument being the foundation to many, many of my compositions because it's still very unfamiliar to me because it, it's still a learning process. And in that learning process, there's life for me. That's what gives me, that's what gives me hope. Uh, the, 
the 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 connecting of what may seem like disparate coincidences you know when and it's just like oh can you imagine that so and so was was here at this time and then we happened to and then the you know the planet to line and 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 cg mm-hmm. planet 20 years ago are now taking fruit mm-hmm. so I, i guess it's just a really long-winded way of um saying that nothing is for naught and that everything contributed to this and that what may have seemed unlikely already happened <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> you know that's not long-winded that's that's a deep answer and I thank you for it um i wanted to go to the song ready on the one um because I, I, it's such a a powerful song and i i just wanted to ask one thing about it um i apologize for looking down at my notes but i made them so i could look at them um it, interesting to me the expression ready on the one but um miss brittany uh miss brittany says sings frequently steady on the one and i wanted you to discuss with us the that that those two expressions and what what sticks them together and what what is different about them and what is that song so this album has contributions from two producers there's one producer named preservation dj preservation who has done work with some of my favorite artists that i listen to um on repeat he and i ended up striking a, a a relationship and a friendship during this time of of covid because i admired his work and he started sending me music and the first piece of music that he sent me was um good money which is what we spoke about a couple of minutes ago yes that features uh oh man an amazing talent billy woods and the second piece of music that he sent me was ready on the one which both of these pieces of music that, that, that preservation sent me um they 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 struck an instant an, an immediate chord because unbeknownst to him they were already sonically fitting into this guitar driven stripped back mm-hmm. a uh, body of work that would become Vessels Angels and Ancestors so I I I called him up I said you, you you're not going to believe this but I have about three or four songs that 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 already sound like they they exist within this world it sound like 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 it sound they, they sound like they're living on this planet like 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 they're <laughs> they're, they're engaged and, and you know and uh and I we followed that instinct we did not resist um we embraced it wholly so ready on the one came about it was uh created um well before um good money which is interesting because they're more moving parts in ready on the one you, you mentioned miss britney reese who is my friend uh uh five stars daughter and and five stars also featured on the track he's on the third verse and uh and our other friend spills is on the second verse so we have two other um two other artists from Brooklyn um that I I know and and love and respect and then we have uh Miss Brittany Reese who is uh, uh. who who's 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 addressing us who's gracing us who's blessing us um with her vocals on the chorus um ready on the one ready on the one uh a choreographed the step step of steady on the one steady on the one all mm-hmm. praise and always the best efforts so mm-hmm. i mean in a nutshell uh you're talking about preparedness in the face of uh an acknowledgement uh 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 of 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 your own uh, of i would say of your own divinity 
Mm. Um, so it's not just an acknowledgement of your own divinity and it's not just a preparedness, but it's a preparedness in the knowing of your own divinity, which to me, which to me, um, ups the ante. Um, I went to a, a middle school in Bushwick, Brooklyn called Philippa, F- Philippa Schuyler, Philippa Schuyler, IS-383, Philippa Schuyler Middle School for the Gifted and Talented. It reminds me of the X-Men school for, you know, the gifted and whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the motto of the school was to whom much is given, much is required. Mm-hmm. That stayed with me not just because it was a school motto, but, but because it, it, it felt like a responsibility to whom much is given, much is required. And throughout my years of the ups and the, and the downs, I've more often than not erred on the side of abundance of feeling more like my cup runneth over than I don't have enough. And that also felt like a responsibility. It felt like a responsibility uh, to to feel um, and to know uh, that I was loved, that I was blessed, and to not do that knowledge a disservice or dishonor by looking away or denying it. So now in the music, you know, there's this recurring, there's this recurring character throughout this album, Shorty. Shorty Shorty. in the corner. We we keep talking to Shorty. You know, I'm trying to show Shorty that the stars in him, God's in him. you know, who is Shorty if not me when I was, you know, 10, 12, 14? Who is Shorty if not my son who just celebrated his first birthday last week? Who is Shorty if not my daughter who just celebrated her fourth birthday? So that responsibility of knowing uh, and and then being able to to tell others, hey, I was just up here, and even though your 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 path, you, your experience may, may be totally different, what I saw was this, what I experienced was this, especially, especially if you know that two blocks ahead, there's a a, a four alarm blaze, and 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 and, and, and toxic fumes, you mm-hmm. want to say, hey, don't, you know, th- th- there's something up ahead. That's that's just not copacetic. And, you know, a lot of the message to the, the, the message and the messaging to Shorty is 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 that coming from a place of love in the form of a heads up. It's a heads up. Um, it's not a it, it, it's not a it's not a mission critical directive. You must do this. It's it, it's not obligatory language. You, you should do this. No, no. You're on your, you're on your experience. You are on your, you are in your boat. You are going downstream. I'm in my boat. I'm going downstream, but I see you Mm -hmm. and you see me. Mm -hmm. And maybe as we're going downstream, maybe there's an opportunity for um, you to throw me something or for me to toss you something or for me to hold your hand. I, I, you know, I have to, you know, sort of breaks the rules a little bit, but because this podcast is about your work, but I have to say something here. You mentioned Malcolm X in the song, and um, I have to say that uh, I got to get the date right. On February twenty-first, no, on February twelfth, nineteen sixty-five, um, I had an amazing experience with Malcolm X. And um, I wanted to tell you about it, if you don't mind. Uh, I was a university student. I was 20 years old. And um, Malcolm was one of my idols, amongst a few others. But he was special and very distant, but meant everything to me in a way. And 
on that afternoon of February 12th in Birmingham, there'd been a, a kind of a right wing, um, not an insurrection, but it's someone running for parliament who was a, definitely a fascist. Malcolm X had come to England to speak at the Oxford Union and to speak to certain politicians. And he decided to go away from London and come up to Birmingham where I was at university. I did not know this because of this extraordinary rightist, horrible thing that was happening. Many, many, many West Indian, Jamaican, Trinidadian uh, people in Jamaica uh, that had moved to Birmingham. It was the center of, of the West Indies um, immigration. I was a very happy one, actually. And I lived in in Moseley and in Edgbaston, which is where Jamaicans were and where I learned about ska and rock steady and so forth. And when I learned that Malcolm was there in Birmingham, I was astonished. And then I heard even more astonishing that he was coming to the university and going to give a talk to the Islamic Society. I was beside myself, went to the Student Union Hall, which held about four or 500 people. It was packed. Just started to walk in and then an Iranian friend of mine who was running the thing said, David, you can't come in here. And I said, why not? He said, because you're not a member of the Islamic Society, you're not Islamic. I said, okay, that's true. How about the fact that, that, that I, uh, I completely um, am moved and changed by Malcolm's autobiography and I, it's one of the great desires of my life to meet him or at least to see him. I must come in here. And they said, you're not coming in and we'll call security. There was a small staircase behind me and Malcolm X and two other people were walking down it and he stopped and listened to this conversation. And he came and stood beside me and looked at my Iranian friend and said, what is this about? And he said, oh, sir, um, this person here wants to get in, but he's not Islamic. And Malcolm said, I was in Mecca. I saw people of all stripes, colors, persuasions in the mosques that I sat in. Uh, come in with me, sir. What's your name? I said, David Silver. I said, come in. I always reserve a place right in front of me, one place for one person that I know I'll find. You're it. So come and sit in front of me. So for three hours, I did. And it was an astonishing experience to be, what, eight feet from him in his incredibly impeccable outfit, his uh, McGregor tartan <laughs> vest, sports jacket, his look, but more than anything else, his words and his charisma, which I'd never come across anyone like that before or since, to be honest. And it ended, I was so sad when it ended. And then when he was leaving, he turned and beckoned at me and said, come. So I spent another 40 minutes with Malcolm in a room when he interrogated me about why I was so impressed as an Englishman living in England uh, and what he had to say and who he was. And I told him. It wasn't hard, John. And he got out a little notebook and a pen and he wrote down his number. It was a 212 area code. He said, come to America soon and I'll take you around New York. I like you. You've got some courage. Now, for everybody watching this, I'm not a particularly braggadocio person, so forgive me. I was so amazed. I dined out on this. I called my dad, my mom, my brother, my sisters, my friends, everyone, and told them about this epiphany. And um, on the 21st of February, Malcolm was killed which was just, you know, two weeks after I met him. So I never saw him again. But I came to America. 60%, 70%, maybe 80% because of what he'd said to me. And I wanted to go to Harlem and I wanted to see where he trod. So his effect on me was profound and it was profound. It's a word that's banded around. It was monumental. Changed my entire life. And it fits in with what you were just saying. That somewhere, somehow, someplace, somebody comes, someone who's unknown, a guy that's mending your cable, or it's Malcolm X. For me, it was Malcolm X at that time. 
So when I heard you say his name on that song, it all came flooding back to me, man. It really did. Because that was the... After that, Bob Marley and, and Ram Dass. So I had these incredible people in my life that changed me instantaneously, John. And I've never moved back or forwards or sideways from there since. So I just wanted to tell you that because I was so... When I heard you mention his name and his death, it all came flooding back now. Just how important this man was. Because the essence of that speech was we're all the same. We're all equal. We're all angry. And we're all saved. It's not just Muhammad, but it's God. And we must not fight with each other at all. Because equality of being is imperative at this time. That's a quote from what he said. I'll never forget it. Which is very reminiscent of how uh, Ram Dass opens this album. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. It's, it's seen in setting. Um, Ram Dass, uh, words from Ram Dass, um, open and, and close this experience. And, uh, and one of the things that he says in, in the beginning of of, of, of the experience that grounds the audience in uh, what's about to transpire is that we have to have a lot of compassion for others as well as ourselves. Because before you can learn to love anyone else, you have to love yourself. And so this work, the work feels... Um, it feels critically independent. Uh, it feels empowering in that regard. To know that every bit of, 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 of that change, of that positive force begins with you. Mm. This is a <laughs> so true. This is a good time to discuss a little bit. You were coming together with Ram Dass and with Love to Remember. It's not. It, it, it's sort of counterintuitive, uh, not because of your career or your background, but anybody coming to it, it's, it's a miracle, really. Uh, and um, I we're all attracted to the light. It's, we, it's, 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 yeah. we are. But you know, Ram Dass is very honest. I was always very honest about everything, and 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 had absolute grasp of the fact that, it, it, you know, that the, the, the incarnation we're in on this planet at this time is, is, is full of, 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 of hills and valleys. But what, what kind of connectivity and when did you realize that there was something in your life that needed and wanted to be connected with him artistically and spiritually? Talk about the origins of that, if you would. The seeds were planted long, long ago. Um, I think I read Autobiography of a Yogi when I was eight. Really? Wow. It was around the same year that I asked my mom to get me Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard because they were running <laughs> these commercials. It was 1984. <laughs> 83, I don't know, no, so, yeah, 84, I was nine. Um, they were running these commercials on, on television, you know, and they had these profound questions, and uh, I don't, I, in retrospect, I don't, I'm not even sure, I don't, I'm not even sure I remember what the questions were, but but it was like, do, do you want this question answered? Turn to page 79 of this book, and I said, oh, of course. So, 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 so these books are answering questions, great. And, um, you know, I, I was I was a, an avid rabbit holer of of, <laughs> of seeking, you know, divine insight as as far back as I could remember. Um, you know, I remember, and I'll, I'm I'm going to get to your question, but this but this but this sort of contextualizes it. But I remember. Um, 
again, this was, I was sec- second grade. I was eight years old and we were standing around in the, the school park before classes began. And we were talking about life and death. We were talking about well, where were we before and where will we go after? And I remember this conversation like it was yesterday. And I remember just chiming in, not having um, many, or, or, or not experiencing up until this point many conversations bef- about the subject matter b- before this. So it wasn't like I was well versed in it. But I remember saying, um, I, I just posed the question to the, to the group. I said, do any of you remember uh, w- w- where you were b- b- before you were born? And you know, it was kind of like taking a survey around. No, no, no. And I said, well, maybe that's because you were always here. And, <laughs> and I didn't, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of tongue in cheek. But where did that come from? Where did that intuition, where did that intuition come from? I came from a place where it's always been and where it is and where it always will be. It took me a, a long time, relatively speaking, to want to uh, divest from the constructs. You know, in one shape, form, or fashion, in every shape, form, or fashion, everything around us is constructed as the manifestation of an idea. So my journey to Ramdas probably preceded Ramdas. And it probably preceded me. I'm reminded of an old adage that says our paths are deeply connected long before and after we meet. Long before and after we meet. We realize all of these touch points, all of this overlap. This is your cousin. Oh, this is my... We're so, so deeply connected. So in one way or another, I think I was, I've always been here having this conversation. Uh, Having uh, the conversations that challenge what we accept on face value, wanting to peel back those layers because I've always known that there was something more, that there was something deeper, that that there was purpose and meaning. And without being able to point to one book or one film or one song. The experience has been best served for me by taking the best part along the way, the most inspiring parts. And then using those, those bits that would be polished into treasures and turning them into my art, which will hopefully inspire someone else to turn it into something else. So my attraction to Ram Dass, to Alan Watts, to Abraham Hicks, to Muhammad, to uh, Clarence 13X, to my mother, Florine Forte, to my children, 
It's a prayer. It's, it's, it's the same affinity and affection and, and divine love that, that it's always been. You know, beautiful spiritual beings like Ram Dass during their their moments of in between birth and death or their, their, these their, during their moments in between their transitions they serve as beacons reminders mirrors in many cases to what we already know and suspect. But there are those of us, me included, who appreciate, who appreciate it when it's said, who appreciate it when, when, when others can articulate it, when others can sing about it, when others can paint about it. Mm. And we can go, oh, that's right. It wasn't just here. Because you see it too. Because you feel it too. Because you know it too. Those who know. Those who know. And so Ramdas was, is, and will be one of those among us who who knew and know. Yeah. Yes. I I, I... I really so agree with you about hearing something and realizing, oh, I think that I'm not crazy and I'm not stupid, probably. Uh, he said it and I love his head. So great. You know, I mean, Alan Watts is, is, is particularly redolent of that, you know, that he says things and you go, yep, that's right. <laughs> My God, that's right, Alan. The um, resonance, the resonance. Yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful miracle because you could go your whole life without ever, you know. I mean, it, obviously, this is true of, of of many people, and it's it's not a, a judgment because we all come to whatever we come to when we're supposed to come to it. If there is perfection, that's part of the perfection, isn't it? I mean, you know, um, I when when I was listening to the album the first time. Um, it brought to mind other artists and I put them in a zone. It's what I call the multidimensional zone of art where it's not just portraying suffering or romantic love or the things that Frank Sinatra sang about. Nothing wrong with Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole. I mean, they were great artists actually and did affect one's emotional body. But then in the 60s, what happened and before that, in blues and rhythm and blues, but particularly in the 60s, it was, it was sort of huge, was the, the growth of the multidimensional musician and messenger. Um, John Lennon, when I first heard Revolver, for instance, uh, that was the album that really did it for me. And songs like Tomorrow Never Knows and Within You, Without You, suddenly to hear George Harrison singing Within You, Without You, and I thought, that's what it is. It's within you, without you. Oh, my God, George, thanks a lot. I didn't know George, but I knew him then because I knew what he said. And when Lennon sang Instant Karma, I knew what he was talking about. And it all seemed like, well, this is every day now. Great. But it wasn't to be. Everything has a beginning, middle, and end. You know, it's ironic. There's a certain dark symmetry about the fact that it always struck me that you know, John Kennedy was was murdered in November, November 22nd, 63, and the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan three less than three months later. Mm. John Lennon was murdered in December 80, and Ronald Reagan was elected and installed in January 81. Two sides of this turbulent planetary consciousness that we're all involved with. When I was listening to this album, there were many occasions when in it, the poetry just was that multidimensional recognition. Oh my God, yes, 
I thought that once. I'm thinking it now. Oh, God, thank you, John. Um, but it's it's not necessarily the, the, the sort of general sort of direction of, shall we say, popular art. I mean, when, when Picasso did Guernica... By design. Was, yeah, by design, exactly. By design, yeah. So Picasso does Guernica and lets the world know that the, the Nazis had bombed a village or the Franco or whoever bombed that village and was mass murdering already. And he did it for that reason. He did it so that people would know because they knew about Picasso, but they didn't know about that. And if you look at Guernica, it's all in there, right? And it's fantastic now that this is begun, it is beginning to be, you know what it's like? It's like what we thought in the 60s is happening now. Mm. We didn't, didn't necessarily happen in the 60s. It really didn't, but we all thought it. Like, let's love one another. What's the problem? Why don't we love each other? And why don't we show each other that respect that generates community and therefore generates change? Um, so I, I wanted to sort of, you know, Raga and I hate to gush about anything. It's probably because of our backgrounds, but um, I'm English, he's Canadian, both problematic. Um, <laughs> You know, I you know it took me years to sort of be happy. But um, I, when I was listening to the album, I was saying to my wife constantly, "This is going in those two wonderful parallel directions at the same time, of personal suffering and observation of other suffering, and liberation from suffering through the the recognition of the present and of the perfection of the present." And you do it. There's no question in my mind that you do it, and it's very conscious, and I know that it's also, it seems to me, effortless, which is part of the delight of, of, of great art, you know, that it just, just seems to roll off you. I want to look at my notes a minute because I've made so many notes. Um, and I want to, you know, what you said before, source, what you do is something called legit source. There are illegitimate sources too, you know, lies. Yes. Lies. Yes. And... Um, uh, but the, the, when, when you can hone in on those that are ameliorating for as many yes. people as is humanly possible, like the words of Ram Dass. Ram Dass was never recondite in what he said. Mm. It was clear. It was like, you know, words that we use. And the lectures, when I used to go to lectures to him, I thought he was like, you know, Lenny Bruce with Godhead. That's mm. how I would describe it. He was funny as hell. And he wasn't just funny to make a joke to, to break the seriousness, John. He was funny all the way through the Godhead lectures. Mm -hmm. And I used to sit in those lectures. And I knew him, but it didn't matter. I sat and looked at him talk, listened to him talk, and thought, God, this is one of the funniest men alive. Because he saw the incredible contradictions that are apparent in our lives between that liberation and that construct, or the many constructs. Uh, you know, I watched The Matrix again a week or so ago. I don't think it's a very good film, actually. <laughs> As a you film, don't think The Matrix is a good film? No. Um, uh. I think, the, I think the, 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 um, the idea behind it is, and the fact that we live in this construct of which, of which we know not, and we observe its rules, even though we know not why we, we're sort of full of fear. So we observe red pill, green pill. But, and I, why I didn't love it was because it seemed at some points to drop into a sort of cowboys and Indians chasing, shooting each other, which bothered mm. me. I wanted more, I wanted a more cerebral Keanu. Uh, but it's a monumental film, really, uh, because it, once again, it tread, it tread that thing between multidimensional and shallow. You know, and there's nothing wrong with some shallow water, you know, here and there. You know, uh, but well, the not. shallow you, you can't access the water without uh, without going through the shallow bits or you can't access the ocean without without going through the shallow bits. Uh, and so the shallow will introduce you uh, and will hopefully, uh, you know, make it so you don't you're not over your head too quickly because. Uh, a, a, a lot of folks, uh, you know, when they're out of their depths, um, they, they panic. And there is something to be said about knowing, right? And, you know, there's, a, there's an old adage, you know, um, knowledge is like high explosives. Um, you've, got to, you, you've got to be careful. Um, so I, I hear you, and, and, and that resonates.
but there's also a reason why, you know, popular culture hmm. uh, is is often um, you know, judged or ridiculed as being, you know, too shallow. But 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 there's something very very deep about getting millions of people to like a song or to like a film. Um, it's almost like two sides of the same coin. You know, it's, uh, it's dinner with Andre on, on the one side for the folks who, 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 can, who can happily just watch a couple of people eating for two hours and just have that conversation and be wrapped with that. Mm. And then you need and then you other people who need the explosions and the, the bang bangs and the, 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 the high speed. And it's kind of all fruit of the same tree. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I don't know. I, I don't know why, why, but 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 the Matrix definitely left a huge impression on me. Um, and when you said that you watched it recently, I was like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Maybe I should. Maybe I should turn on the Matrix this evening. Well, I, I, you know, my criticisms of it are are, are are trivial, really, because I did watch the whole film again, and I saw that what the what the writers. I like the writing when directing, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, knew that we were in a time when people were being hypnotized in massive numbers, both by lies and versions of the truth, but mainly by lies. And that we just saw that for five, the last five years, four or five years. Um, the fact that on the album, you cover, you cover the territory um, between... You know, we talked about this before, but it, it can't be talked about enough because I've felt in myself um, frequently, you know, how can this world be so fucking horrible? You know, it's the old question. What kind of God would allow Rwanda? You know, I'm reading a book about Rwanda right now, and Burundi, and it's just astonishingly, astonishingly awful, beyond description. And while I'm reading it, it's a book about a, a young Burundi man who escaped the genocide and found himself in New York City without a job, sleeping in the park for months. No money, no job, no anything. Did not speak a word of English. It's a true story. So a guy called Tracy Kidder wrote the book. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner, but the book is called Strength, The Remains of Strength. I'll, I'll get the, the thing for you. It's a wonderful book because what it's about is this young man who had aspirations in his little village in Burundi and, and, and they were shattered by this mm -hmm. absurd Tutsi thing between the Hutus and the, the, it was just the craziest war, internal war. It looks about that, but it's really about his triumph in New York City being at the, as he puts it, the lowest end of any spectrum of living in New York City, which was first living in a squatter place on 127th Street, and then living in the park because he couldn't stand that. So he lived in a, under several bushes in the park for months. Well, I'm reading, I'm, I'm just finishing the book today, actually, and I just thinking about how fortunate I've been in the sense that I've never had to actually sleep in the park and would probably be too scared out of my wits to do such a thing. For him, that was nothing compared with, you know, Hutu um, malicious chasing his family and killing them all, except him, every one of them. The presence of that dynamic in the world, the constant presence, not just now, but and the aspiration of spiritual grasp is a dynamic that I think runs through your beautiful album. And I find it incredibly heartening that you've you put this together, that people just as you 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 grasped instantaneously be here now because you were here now before you were here. Uh, when I listened to your work um, carefully, uh, delight, delightedly, um, those two streams were just constantly coming and going. Uh, you know, when you talk about the storm, going back to that, this absurdist notion of apocalypse created by lunatics, really. Um, and then hear the words... They're in every song, really. I mean, I, I just want to put on my glasses and look at a couple of songs. 
As I said, I'm against deconstruction, but I'm for quoting. Um, <laughs> there's one I'm looking for, which I have to find. Pardon me a minute, because I love it. You say, the world looks different with the filter missing, but it may look the same from the still position. That blew me out of my desk, you know, because I know what you're talking about. Uh, and I want you to talk about that now, that, that exact phrase, if you would be so kind. It, it hits deep. And I don't necessarily know why it hits deep. The world looks different with the filter missing, but it might look the same from a still position. You know, even as it's said, it's not it's not said with with condescension. It's not said with 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 this judgment. It's said as an offering. Um, the world looks different with the filter missing, right? And that's just and that's just whatever whatever that construct is that you're investing in. Is it is, is it the racial construct? Is it the political construct? Is it the economic construct? Is it the socioeconomic construct? Like what? Rip it away. Okay, that's that, that's one way of seeing a truth, and then another way of seeing a truth is just, or seeing a truth, is just sitting with it, closing your eyes, is being still in that truth. So you can go out and you can go on your journey, and you can adventure, uh, and 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 get to your deeper truth that way, or you can sit still. You can have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant, man. I love that line so much. I wrote it in big <laughs> letters. So I wouldn't have to wear my glasses, but they weren't big enough. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to just mention to the people watching this uh, an amazing song on the album called Zug Zwang. And I happen to know what that means. <laughs> it's uh, Are you a chess player? I'm a really bad one. My dad taught me to play chess. And chess. No, horrible. I, I, I learned it when I was five. You know, I thought, oh God, I'm a prodigy. And then I've lost it. I've lost every game since. But, um, you know, I'm, no, I'm a terrible, terrible chess player. I can't think two steps ahead. I can't. But, you know, Zug Zwang, I, I think, means having to make an obligatory move that is not a good one. Uh, but you have to make it, which happens in chess when you have no choice. It's like tackling someone in the penalty area in a football any game. Any like, other move is worse. Any I, other, you have yeah, to right. make a move. You are, you are, you are, com, you are com, com, compelled to move. You have to com, compulsory. <laughs> you have to move. But any move that you make is going to be worse than you yeah. just staying on that square, staying in that position. And I, I thought to myself when I heard the term, the, the term, and then felt that. <laughs> felt that I was playing it, playing a game, and and then I just, oh my gosh, zig swing! Like it, it just hit me. It's, no matter what I do next, it, I'm, it's going to put me at a comparative disadvantage than than, than than me just staying here, which would, of course, make me want to go eat or use the restroom or somehow delay the game indefinitely so that I don't have to move. So now you think about that in in real world terms. Mm. And you think about our, our character on this album, Shorty, who is on his corner, who is on his block, who is in you know, his, his territory, if you will. And you know, he's standing outside of the bodega, but he feels like his back is up against the wall because he doesn't know uh, what's, uh, what's up three blocks away or... Mm. What's up in, 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 you know, across the bridge or uh, through the tunnel. And so there's that real um, fear. There's that apprehension to do anything other than what you know. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to speak to that. I wanted to speak to that in in as real world terms as I could. So I, I, I put it to a story. Yeah, you surely did. I mean, that song, um, it, it, you know, it, 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 there are many times in life, obviously, you know, when that occurs, 
that exact scenario comes up when you realize, okay, I got to do this. And if I don't do it, it's going to be infinitely worse. So I got to do it. I'll grit my teeth. And it's not necessarily courageous. It's just pragmatic, really. But I love the fact you called the song that because, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things that um, people don't know. I, I refuse to deconstruct something, but I want to say one thing. Hungry is an astonishing track. And, and I found out, I didn't know this, and I, I, I know Ben a little bit, um, that you did a song with him called Best That Love Could Be So I, I, in 2009, and I sought it out. And what? And it's amazing, because the same teamwork is going on there. It's a bad word, it sounds like, you know, b basketball. But basically, the two of you fuse two very different sounds, fuse on that song, that earlier song, but certainly on Hungry. Um, and what a great title for a song, Hungry. You know, uh, I, I think it's one of Ben's lines when he says, it took everything from me. Uh, I, I, things, little things that, do they matter to you? That doesn't matter, to, that doesn't matter to you. You repeat that at the end of the song. And at first, I reversed it on the, on the, my iPhone and my headphones. I thought, wait a minute. It wasn't. And, and then I realized that it keyed in with me in the sense that I, one can get extraordinarily upset about something. And then someone can say something or you can drop something on your foot or you can smoke a joint and go, doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> the... Um... It's, uh, and the nominees are those little things. It's, it's a welcome to the most pretentious show ever. Yeah. And the no <laughs> and the nominees are <laughs> the little drum roll. Those little things that matter. <laughs> <laughs> the it's nominee just, is an anomaly, you say. Right, and, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, and and I, you know, for, for some people, I suppose it isn't. You know, for um, Meryl Streep. But um, I, I think of you back then, whenever it was, two thousand six, whenever. The Grammy came, you know, that in that moment, you know, when you're being appreciated, it's lovely, you know, it's lovely. And to deny it is, is, is silly, but, but it is kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, that we need individuals sometimes to be given awards, not even ourselves, other people, so that we can sort of gladden our day a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, I worked with Martin Sheen once and, and he told me that he would never get an award because he was so rude to the to, to everyone who gave them because he felt that art was not a competition mm. and why should you know uh i don't know back in the day you know it, it was so interesting that when the beatles and the stones and dylan and Joni mitchell and neil young and were happening you know none of them got grammys <laughs> They were still giving Grammys to people from, you know, Stephen Eady. And it was it was really weird for us to be watching the show. It's a great reminder. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a great reminder. Yeah. They, they didn't get them. You know, now later, you know, everybody was all over John and everything because he was nice and dead. But um, it is interesting the way that you put that. The you know, nominee is an anomaly. And that's a metaphor for me for the whole thing of praise and and how to look at praise. And how not to eat it like it's a lunch and then spit it out to everybody you can possibly spit it out to. Like I did to my dad about Malcolm X, you know. He, he told me to stop calling because I kept calling him because he was also a Malcolm X fan. And, um, you know, he, he made me read the book. Um, one time we were driving in Lancashire on our way to Yorkshire. You know, there's a great battle, the white rose and the red rose between those two counties that mm -hmm. was English war for centuries. And they both, to an American, are the same place, you know, or even to someone from London are the same place. And he stopped the car once and he said, I don't want you guys to hate people from Yorkshire because we were Lancastrians. And I was there with my, my siblings and we said, what, why are you saying this? He said, racism is a disease. Do you understand that? Don't forget that ever or I'll kill you. That's exactly what he said. It was 1958. Bless his heart. 1950. Wow. Yeah, bless his heart. I mean, he taught me that in a second, you know, not without, you know, with a whole, I mean, we knew, we sort of knew, but when your father says that, stops the car and says it, and he was first referring to our cricket games between Lancashire and Yorkshire and how much emotion would go into those games that we had to win.
I understand sports. That's what it's about. Right. But when it gets to that point where you hate the other side, where there's that vitriol, there's that disdain that's predicated on nothing other than them being the other. Well, yes. that's, yes. that's that's dangerous. Yes, it is. And um, again, it's extremely valuable when people who are watching or listening to this podcast get it. I want you to, and I don't want to sound like a promotion man here, but I want you to experience this album uh, mainly because it, it, it's sort of like Shakespearean in a way because it, it just involves everything from extreme difficulties through to the very concept of love being the connector of all of us and it actually being the Godhead and we don't have to go much further than love if we don't have to we don't have to uh, we sometimes take secur circuitous roads to it. I did. But the one going back to Roundhouse for a minute, Roundhouse would strain you up really quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, he lived about 10 blocks from me in, in, in on the Upper West Side for a while. And I would go visit him, you know, and, and sit with him and tell him my troubles like he was a psychiatrist again. You know? <laughs> and he would listen, you know, he would listen to me with a smile on his face. Like, you really think this is trouble, Dave? I say, yeah, my second marriage is disintegrating, Ron Roddy. It's going away. And I love her and I love my daughter and I, I want to cry and I want to die. Yeah. And he would say, come on, man. It's just a marriage. It's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not the Buddha's pure land. And even the mm. Buddha's pure land isn't Buddha. Mm. You know, I, the, the album, I, I mean, it's so easy to, to be rhapsodic about things these days because words come out. But I just want to go through a few more things for people watching. Um, the end of the album is as the beginning as Rondas talking. And I wanted to ask you a question, John, about that. Because... Um, he's talking about who you are beyond time, beyond space, without form, which is the ultimate, ultimate Buddhist and back to yogic desire, if you like, but not just applying to them, to all of this. But then it ends. Um, uh, he talks about rest in tomorrow. Rest in... No. Now, what is he saying? I thought it was he said, tomorrow. He says rest in love. Oh, Rest in love, and I'm I'm, oh. I'm glad that I'm, I'm glad that you think it's tomorrow because that makes me now want to go revisit the mix and make sure that if well, there's what, any I way mean, that I can I can no, bring out love. Think? It says rest <laughs> in love. No, but John, what came out of it was the most ridiculous, you know, extrapolation from that because I thought, okay, be here now, rest in tomorrow, be here now. What, is it? <laughs> what the fuck is John doing here? You know, <laughs> but I actually <laughs> rationalized it. I did. I thought, okay, this is a deal. Uh, <laughs> Pe 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 Pema Children says many times that if you don't rehearse death, you'll be real scared when you're dying. And to to rehearse it doesn't mean lying on the floor and, and not breathing, but just coming to terms with, with the constant occurrence, seems seemingly a constant occurrence of death. And she says, well, you know, if you just rehearse enough, you won't be frightened at the end. And then you can rest into what becomes. Mm -hmm. And so that was my rationale. I thought, okay, John did this thing, faded it out tomorrow. And that's because after the process of liberation, you can rest in tomorrow. Mm. You're not, you have no fear about it. So it made a lot of sense to me and it was completely wrong. And I apologize. For that. No worries. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad that you, that you brought up that track though, because it, it leads me to an earlier point that I was talking about. And that was um, the additional production contribution uh, on on this album and so with dj preservation contributing to two tracks and uh emil mcgloin contributing to the final track which is ancestors which is the track that we were just talking about which has uh ram das's closing words and um emil mcgloin is a very very talented uh producer as well as uh, an amazing guitarist um taking great pleasure in collaborating with him over the years and um uh, and, and just in, in inviting him to 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 play with us, and uh, and it just feels so fitting that he has that contribution, which which closes out, um, you know, this album and ends with <clears throat> the 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 what we just listened to. It, it, it sounds like it goes into a, a reverse, slow down time warp of a of a mechanism, and that's how it kind of 
wraps up in a in a in a bow. Yeah. Um, but that track, you know, uh, ancestors, um, you know, that is. I mean, I'm selfishly, it's a gift for my children. Um, hmm. It reaffirms and underscores the suspicion, the hope, um, that inkling that, um, you know, what we call death is, uh, you know, it's a door, right? Rather than, <laughs> rather than lights out, uh, you know, I think of, Helmholtz and 1887, you know, energy is, or, or, or the transitive properties of energy. Uh, energy is neither lost nor formed, but, uh, but um, transferred. And so there's a lot of, of, of that thematically, um, you know, throughout this album, talking about this, this notion of uh, passing through something as well as this too shall pass. So on the one side of this too shall pass, you've got the eternal nature of everything and all things, including but not limited to ultimately you. Um, and that's not contradictory to me. It, mm. That's breathing. That's breathing. It's in and it's out. It's temporary. It's eternal. It's temporary. It's eternal. It's fleeting. It's everlasting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's it's uh it's rather daunting to speak after those words actually. Um because what could be more what could be more crucial to our equanimity? You know, our our present equanimity because you know, it's the okay, balance. I, yeah, it is and the balance is uh, you know, you can lose it real quickly, and sometimes it takes centuries. Well, according to Buddhist teachers who meditate, you know, 18 hours a day for 50 years, who possibly know more than I do, um, it's uh, most likely no more than I, it, it is necessary to accept this thing as being universal and, in a sense, a gift, because life is difficult. I mean, they didn't teach me this in school in England, that, you know, that, that things would come up out of the blue, of the loss of a great friend, and that's one that particularly gnaws at you in terms of hope and faith, uh, you know, because you think, oh, my God. Uh, when Peter Simon died, who was my best friend for 50 years, um, his wife and I have spent the last two years speaking two or three times a week. Not about him, but when we had dream about him or when we think about him, we talk to each other because he was a, an illuminating presence in our lives. And um, even though he was unpopular with some people because he was very tactless and honest and honest. <laughs> Mm. He was honest to a core and often made big mistakes in terms of who he would be honest with about whom. But I knew him as my very best friend and, and mm. loved him beyond words. The loss of that human being has been a difficult one for me because uh, we talked all the time about the deepest things imaginable and the most difficult things to talk about. But, you know, about six weeks before he passed, he said to me on the phone, he said, are you coming to the vineyard? And I, I said, no. This was in um, September, I guess, 2019. I said, I can't come. And he said, I'm going to die. And um, I did the usual bourgeois thing, you know. I said, come on, Pete. You've, you've lived through all this stuff in the last few years. You're not going to die. He said, I am going to die, Dave. And he did. And as wearing and as personally 
crushing as, as it was because we talked all the time. Um, because of the rehearsal that Pema Children and Ramdas have taught us, I had rehearsed this because I knew he was really ill. And we have to rehearse these things, just like, you know, you just can't go onto a stage and perform without learning the, the, the lines or learning the progression, the chord progression or whatever. You can't. You have to rehearse. It's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a simulacrum of that, is learning how to cope with the inevitable nature of life and death. You say it's a door. If you keep saying that, people will get it. And, and um, I mean, I don't know how long we've been going here. Let's, let me just check. Um, we've been going an hour and a half. This is so delicious and so kind of you to do this for so long. Um, just a couple more things, John. Of course. This is, this is really exquisite stuff, and I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this. The song Gasp. Um, I kept thinking about, uh, I found a, a glass pipe a few years ago, not a bond, but a, a, an amazing glass pipe by a company mm -hmm. called Grav, G-R-A-V. And it's, it's, it's a form of Sherlock pipe, they call it. And you can, you can put the, the herb in there and it lasts for like a day. <laughs> And it doesn't go away, you know. Yeah. And when I, when I, when I, really, man. And I, I, I can see it. I can see it right now, you know. And um, it's a, beyond the computer. And in the song, <laughs> the song is so great. He gas. Uh, uh, you say that talking about someone. You say he ain't nothing like my shaman, you know. Oh. And I just. Stop so that's so 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 that's please talk about that yeah no, 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 no. So, so, so 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 that is everlast from house of pain from uh yeah um, the greatest um, yeah yeah and so yeah he he is rapping on that second verse and what's interesting about you know that song which is an ode to cannabis as well as uh naysayers as well as um you know, I mean, it, you know, it, well, it, it's an ode to cannabis for me, but you know, Everlast brings in brings in the spirits as well, you know, uh -huh. and <laughs> it's it might be, you know, talk about popular culture. That song might end up being the most popular song that comes uh, uh, off of this album. Um, it's a good song. It's a good song. It's the bridge that does it for me. Um, to be perfectly, wholly honest, the bridge comes out of nowhere, and and it and it just packs a wallop. It's it, I don't know if it's eight bars or sixteen bars, um, but there's something about the spirit, the energy of that song, the truth in that song. You know, Everlast talks about how hard this past year was, you know, acknowledging the, the stress, the, the, the impact that we felt uh, on mass, you know, as, you know, we were, it was a pandemic. That with um, <laughs> all of the other pains and hurts that we uh, experienced, really um, contributed to this this pressure valve uh, uh, and you know gas is a way of f finding out the way to to decompress to um, to coexist with the madness uh, to call it for what it is and still be able to uh, have fun with those you love. Um, yeah, you might say it's a party song and I'm okay with that. Mm. I'm 100% okay with that. You know, you talk about going on stage or or not going on stage before you you practice the set or you or you learn the songs. Well, you can't live without living. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, that's what, that's what these songs feel like to me. These songs feel like, oh, you, you've lived, you've lived too. You know, not just, not just I've lived and this is all about me. It's, it's, it's a, You know, it's a it's a we are here now. As much as it is, I am here now. It's a we are here now. Um, feeling uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, to say the 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 least, it, it is. I mean, for me as a, a consumer of it, if you like, um, with no connection whatsoever, no con connection with it whatsoever. Just you know, a listener. Um, I'm looking at my notes, and they're pages and pages and pages. Um, they are because I'm, 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 you know, an ex-teacher, and I do that stuff. Um, but I, I mean, I, we've talked about most of the songs, um, but in one of the songs, you talk about it being not a song, but a satisfaction from shame, 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 shame. It's not a song, uh, but a satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. Can you just uh, ex sort of expand that a little bit? It's what you just said in a way, but yes. Yeah. Um, it's like they came to get them. It's like the main aim was to hit them. Shame, shame the system. To add insult to loss, now it's blame the victim. What's it cost to get change around here? I'm just a stranger passing through. What's that hanging over there? Strange fruit? So familiar. That which doesn't kill you would try to finish. Nietzsche that with a knee on your neck for nine minutes. You hear the sirens in the distance. Uh, they, they're, uh, um, they're not coming. We keep listening. Um, I miss my brother. Yeah, I miss him. You see what they did to him? And then I say, this is not a song. It's a satisfaction. They gave me a call. I wrote a call to action. I know enough to know addition. Coalesce the coalition. Gang, build, build. So in this time of divisiveness, of the algorithm doing exactly what it does to separate us while we're while we're doing this reinforcing our, our individual belief systems not being able to tolerate anything that doesn't reinforce that yes um that it, it that neither interests me at at this time nor do i see it as uh, an effective strategy for combating what is clearly uh, our war our current war and that is our inability to see you know, one another, our inability to see, um, to see through the, through the constructs, to see through the veils that we continue to, um, to build. And so I know enough to know addition, coalesce the coalition. So for me, uh, leaning into this notion of working with uh, with those I know, with those I don't know, um, family, with strangers, um, to improve our condition. Figuring it out, figuring it out together. Uh, what happened to George Floyd was not an isolated incident. Um, that song is, and it, it, it points to uh, one of many, but I'd like to use it as a springboard to activate, uh, to activate change that we can, we can bear witness to. You know, God, is that true? And art, you know, if you can talk about art in any sort of generic way, it's, it's usually an indirect or even metaphorical, but certainly personal way of telling the truth. Sometimes when you hit the nail on the head in a, in a preaching way or, you know, the difference between a preacher and a, a great artist is that the artist doesn't have to hammer it away, just tells you his perception of his or her experience and transmutes it. And the transmutation in this album is constant and a welcome return, as far as I'm concerned, to 
an Irv, an artistic Irv, which is determined to break through to those that might possibly just need this word at this time. And I always appreciated that in a great movie or, you know, anything really, any art form. But the fact that you've, you've gone through a lot of changes in your life, beyond anything that most of us are likely to experience, and yet, instead of, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a cliche, but instead of serving time, you, you let, you learn to serve. And, and you are serving. And I know about your charitable work, and I'm sure that other, others know a lot about it too, and it's extraordinarily amazing, particularly the stuff after your Russian tour, which I read about, and helping people in that place, which is a difficult place to be born and live in and your work with 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 um, young men and women who are at risk and some are more at risk than others and we thank you deeply for that but the fact that you can make this kind of album at this time is very important all words are important and your words are healing demonstrably pragmatic and quite, quite beautiful. So thank you, John. Thank you, David. And thank you for doing this. It was remarkable to me. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite an honor to be able to um, speak to you about this work, as well as to um, just have this conversation. And I look forward to um, hopefully having a few, if not many, many, many more. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>